Okay, um, guys, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for coming to the Data Mesh Theater. Um, and today, I'm going to be covering Data Mesh streaming patterns um, and try to give you a real-time perspective. Uh, just uh, by way of inter introduction, I'm one of the founders in Stream, and I'm head of products there. Um, just my background, um, I used to be uh, responsible for the Oracle product portfolio on Oracle's data integration. Uh, that included the Oracle Golden Gate product, uh, uh, data integrator, uh, data quality products. Uh, so I ran their development and product management. And I was ex-CTO of a company called Golden Gate that was acquired by Oracle. And uh, before that, uh, I was in the Oracle kernel for about 10 years, uh, mainly driving uh, redo generation right ahead logging. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is event streaming, and that's closely tied to uh, some of these concepts. Uh, so I'm going to try and give you a real-time perspective. Uh, everyone's been talking about the data mesh, um, so we'll try to dissect that. So in terms of the agenda, um, it's really difficult when there's an emerging topic, and it's a difficult topic. Uh, everyone wants to know what it is. Uh, it's kind of like the matrix, where you are not quite sure what it is, but you're in it. Um, so. I'm going to take a few things for granted, and uh, I'm going to define some of the assumptions, and also sort of try to give at least sort of a quasi-definition for what a data mesh is. So that's the highlights part of it. And then, um, you know, I'm going to try and uh, talk about some of the emerging data management uh, requirements, which sort of have an overlap with the data mesh. So one of them is a conceptual, you know, pattern. It's a way to sort of you know approach uh, data management, uh, maybe you know. Uh, socially, from a people point of view, with some technology involved. Then there's you know projects that we see in the real world where naturally all of us are trying to take advantage of you know newer hardware uh, 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 innovation, newer technical innovation, cloud-based innovation. So I'm going to try and do my best to merge these things together. And by the end of the 30 minutes, hopefully we'll have some clarity at least on you know the overlap between these areas. And today, the focus will be on real time, right? So I'm going to talk about what does it mean to add real time to a data mesh? What are the challenges and complexities? So that part of the talk is going to get a little technical, but I'll try to stay at the design level. And um, I'm going to uh, summarize the whole thing, you know, trying to tell you, you know, one specific thing we have done at Stream, uh, which is a company that I, that, um, I had got products on, of how we have approached that problem and these challenges and complexities, and try to give you a framework around that. Okay, so that's kind of the level set uh, for this session. So in terms of the definition, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, authorities at this, uh, at this event on the data mesh. So I can't speak more than people who have coined the phrase or invented the, the, the terms. But one of the things that caught uh, me was this idea that data products have to play nicely with each other in a data mesh. Okay, so I'm going to try to figure out what does this nicely mean. Okay, and the second part is about, you know, the data consumer. That everything is at the heart of a data consumer. People are, you know, very knowledgeable, very savvy, very greedy. Greedy in the sense that I want to consume the data when I want it, how I want it, on my terms. Right, so that naturally moves us towards a very consumer-driven data economy. Okay, and that's a key part of this data mesh. And so, um, what does it mean to play nicely with the data mesh? Okay, well, there are microservices patterns. There are more efficient ways to integrate different nodes in a data mesh. And so that leads specifically today, I'm gonna to talk about log-based integration, which is a key part of, uh, of, my, of my talk. And this whole idea about consuming data in different ways, which is a polyglot data movement aspect of it. Okay? So here is what I think a typical data consumer actually looks like. This is a healthcare example, okay? And what, what the end result here is, I wanna be able to type in a medical record number. And I wanna be able to just, just like I do a search using a search engine like Google, I should be able to see the results. That's really what this looks like from a consumer perspective, okay? So the interesting thing is that when it comes to consumption, there are physicians, there are lab technicians, there are your partners, there's the patients, right? All of these guys are trying to look at the data and all of them want to consume this in different ways. So what does that do? It introduces a number of interesting data challenges. Right from how is the data organized? How fresh is the data? Okay. Um, how do you actually go ahead and visualize the data? How do you make sure that the data is not crossing any boundaries in terms of authentication and visibility, 
that you need to make sure that you know it's identity access protected. It's also complying to standards like HIPAA, and you know all of the PII information is secure. Things like that. Okay. So another assumption I'm going to make is so a data mesh conceptually consists of a lot of different nodes, and each node can be thought of as a data product. And a data product can be thought of as anything that actually serves a specific purpose. Right? It's a specific purpose. For example, it could just be you know, a report or a dashboard or a materialized view, things that uh, you know, people have written about. And you know, there's ways in which you can query for this. There's ways in which you, can, you have APIs to talk to it. And possibly, you can charge for it. Right? So, you, so everything centers around this consumption model. So naturally, if you want to do this at different points in the mesh, one thing is obvious. You're going to have multiple copies of this data. And you know, there's a whole paradigm about data sharing and so forth in the industry that's going on. At least currently, in my view, and you know, for those of us who are sort of looking at this problem, yeah, that's generally a hard problem because if you start accessing data from the same location from multiple points, let's say in a mesh, then you're going to actually make that thing very, very hot. Okay, so naturally this distributed multiple copies paradigm is here to stay, and I think that's a key part. And I think other people who talk about the mesh and are popularizing the mesh have written about this thing. So let's assume that you're going to have multiple copies of the data. Okay, so if you have multiple copies, then you run into some interesting, in interesting uh, ways to look at that. So um, What's happening really then with this mesh is it is decentralized, and I think that's, again, I'm going to assume that. You guys can read tons of articles on this thing. So there are three ways in which at least you know, we think about it. One of them is the fact that you, know, you have um, you know, just decentralized applications. So when you create an application, you want the luxury of picking your own stack, your own infrastructure. You don't want to go to a central IT team. You don't want to like get permissions, and you don't want to get like procurement permissions and all that stuff. So that stuff is kind of somewhat outdated at this point in time, you know, from the mesh perspective. So you need to be able to stand that up independently, and that's a key piece of this whole decentralized applications. Number two, when you have a data mesh, then naturally you're talking to different endpoints in the mesh. So that spans sort of, you know. The organizational uh, principle that there are different nodes, and number two, you may be running them not in your own data center, but in you know one or more clouds or hybrid clouds. So it's a concept of you know multi-cloud. And finally, the consumers. So it's an interesting uh, principle in a data mesh that you know you have data as product, and I described what a data as product, some examples there. But there are teams, there are domain teams that are responsible for the ownership of that specific data set. Right? And these guys want to be able to organize it and, and distribute it in different ways. Uh, that could be, you know, for example, consumption for a, for a machine learning model, consumption as a materialized view that gets re refreshed at periodic intervals, consumable as a report. Right? So, so, so you need to basically make sure that these decentralized teams de in a decentralized multi-cloud environment can build decentralized applications. That's kind of what this whole thing is about when it comes to decentralization. So now let me talk about the overlap between emerging uh, requirements with the data mesh, right? So these independently happen to be also true, but they happen, they are, allow us to think of these requirements within the construct of a data mesh, right? So let me start off with just you know, the flexibility part of it. So customers want the flexibility to select best of breed applications. They want to actually also move these applications from one point in the mesh to another point in the mesh or talk to each other at their own luxury. You cannot do a force function to a live critical business application by saying, by the end of next week, we need to have this run on one of the cloud-based uh, 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 systems. Typically, there's a transition. And usually, the transition is not of the entire application. There are portions and that require subsets of that data, and that is sort of the right way to that we see a lot of people do this. Right? So the last part is innovation, where even if you are embarking on a data mesh or these converging data management paradigm shifts, you don't want to give up on your enterprise features. You're not going to give up on high availability and scalability and high performance and security. And you know all of the things that you have taken for granted because there's a lot of innovation we've done for the last 30 years in this space. So you can't just punt on that. You you, you need to incorporate that as well. Okay. So 
I, and I tend to uh, speak a little bit ahead of my slides, so uh, the idea is not to cover the slide. The idea is to just share, you know, some of the some of the the patterns here. So with that, um, you know. I'm going to get into the real-time focus part of it. That was the purpose of this talk, because I thought, you know, what should I cover? It's a broad pattern. So when it comes to real-time, because of the decentralization aspect of it, and because of the data sharing aspect of it, data sharing as in, like, you need to be able to go ahead and make sure that all of the nodes are talking to each other with somewhat information that's, that makes sense um, and is not a mishmash, um, I think ETL is a non-starter here. You have to be current. Yeah, you're going to get very confused if, in a mesh, the way in which you're sharing information needs to be fast and event-based, and you have a bad job that's addressing it. Okay, and so this move from, you know, sort of traditional batch-oriented, discrete job processing used to be a little bit uh, 20 years ago because no business really shuts down anymore. So there's no window per se, and I'm hopefully I'm. This is not a new concept. So on a continuous basis is what we're talking about, right? So we're talking about continuous data movement in a low latency manner so that the points in the mesh can actually go ahead and make sense of what's happening. So there are a lot of challenges when it comes to real time. And these challenges have to do <clears throat> you know, with the fact that there's a high volume of data. There's a lot of number of sources of data, which points to more nodes in the mesh you need to be able to make sure that you are able to identify changes very quickly so that you can share the changes very quickly. And to do that scale with all of the inherent you know, security, privacy, correctness aspects of it is difficult to do. Okay, But those are the real-time challenges because your outlook is continuous. Your outlook is not that, okay, I'm going to run like 12 to 4, and then next day I'm going to run 12 to 4. There is no 12 to 4 if you have a global business because people, the time zones don't quite naturally line up uh, as we want them to. <clears throat> so from a real-time perspective, we need to shift from discrete to continuous processing here, a point I mentioned. And <clears throat> really domain-specialized data teams, you know, they need to be able to move the data from different points in the mesh for some of the cons consumption purposes that I talked about before. So let me get into three very interesting streaming patterns here. There may be additional ones, but these are the popular ones. So um, quick refresher on data streams. The model is a little topsy-turvy. If you look at a database, we store data first and then query it. In a streaming world, uh, you store the queries first and then you throw data at it. Okay, so that's a little bit of a topsy-turvy thing, but let's assume that data streams are the way in which we're going to share data because that leads to event-based streaming and those patterns are the ones that we are talking about. So as you generate events, you know, events lead to state changes. And more often the case, we are all familiar with this, that you know, when you subscribe to a service, there may be a change. The birth of that change results in additional changes. And those additional changes require state management and result in further changes. And th therein lies this circle because multiple people are trying to consume that for different purposes, not just for the core operational reason why the change was born, but more the trickle-down effect in the sense that I want to do analytics on it, I want to actually recommend something based on it, I want to track this in real time, and so forth. So this change management is at the heart of it. So the first data pattern that I want to talk about is something really simple. It's a real-time data integration pattern. Simple to conceptualize, not necessarily to implement. Um, and here, you have a number of different data sources, and you're effectively trying to build a data product. right? An example of that, just to make things very simple, might be you have an operational database where you're running your uh, inventory or product catalog application, and you want to create a storefront in, let's say, Azure Cloud or Google Cloud or AWS Cloud. And that storefront at the back end is running a completely separate infrastructure. It could be running you know, maybe uh, you know, uh, an analytics system. It could be running an operational system. It could be running an event-based uh, hub uh, infrastructure. So how do you actually go ahead and take data from these data sources and produce a new data product which is running in the cloud? This is pattern number one, where you're inventing new data products based on data that's coming in from these siloed data sources. Okay? Pattern two is things become start, start getting interesting. As you're moving the data, if you're smart about it, you're able to roll out data products on the way. This is not too different from traditional paradigms where we invented freeways, we invented railways. We, you start giving services in, in flight. And those services could be new data products. And I'm going to give you an example of this as we go further. 
uh, just to sort of you know conceptualize it, let's say that you know you have a uh, a banking system or a retail system. You may want to track uh, maybe your high spenders or high transaction, uh, high wealth management individuals. So if you see one of these, you may want to along the way prior to your analytic system trying to see in the last hour, what did I do for a report? You may want to alert somebody and say that, hey, um, XYZ made this transaction, here's the amount. You may want to take a look at this. This is an example of rolling out a specific service, a specific data product along the way. This is streaming pattern two. Number three is, is the third streaming pattern. And so this is emerging, and this is the reverse, where data products are creating newer data products. In this case, on the left side, the data product happens to be the first data product I mentioned, which was maybe the analytics system. But now you've analyzed a lot of data, and at the point of engagement, at your application level, where you're interacting with the customer or the service, you want to be able to give them something that you've analyzed from maybe your machine learning model or from your analytics system, and you want to share that so it's actionable. right? This is where recommendations come in very handy for customer experience, and you, can, you guys kind of get that drift. So this is pattern number three also, uh, in the in the uh, I've heard about this as reverse ETL in in, in some of the some of the uh, websites and new startups. So a real time example retail might be like I mentioned. You know you may be running an on prem monolithic mainframe, running inventory and product and catalog systems. And what you want to do is you want to actually roll out a common you know data service. And the data service is running on a cloud front. And this is an example where if you're browsing for items. Uh, instead of yeah, routing you to the to the actual mainframe, we could route you to the storefront. So the storefront in this case serves as a very real-time replica with p potentially additional metadata, potentially additional information, augmented data, but it's close enough to the raw data so that our latency can still be well behaved under a few hundred milliseconds so that you know the the the, the browser doesn't just go away. Right, that's that's a key piece here. So, um, just in terms of a uh, 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 to put something practical behind it, this is one of the largest retailers uh, in the world, and they they did they took this pattern, and they were able to move data to the cloud on a storefront under 200 milliseconds end to end using an implementation where you know they can you know make sure that all of the changes that are happening across their three applications get morphed into events that are applicable at the storefront, and you know. From my mobile, I can actually go into the storefront. I can browse for shirts or jeans or whatever I want, and I'm being sent to the storefront. And then once you hit purchase, then other services take over and then get routed back to the to the system of records. So, um, you know, in terms of the 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 this event streaming in these uh, patterns. I specifically and acutely want to point out the role of something called database chain streams, because these are difficult to deal with. If you have a file and you're writing to a file, events on a rolling basis, um, suffice it to say you could actually take a programming course for a couple of days and parse that file and make it available for streaming purposes. If it's coming in from a business system, like a transactional system, or maybe a NoSQL system, maybe Mongo or Cosmo or a relational system like Postgres, MySQL, et cetera, things become a little bit more tricky to manage it on a continuous basis. So I'm going to talk about some of this complexity and some of the design patterns here, and then tell you what we have done as the last couple of slides so that you guys can get a sense of that. Uh, Eric Broda wrote um, um, an article regarding the data mesh and the role of CDC. This is literally a cut and paste of his graphic. But I just want to like point out, um, and this is available, you guys can Google for it, there's, if you just follow points number one through eight, right? it talks about the role of RDBMS, it produces a write-ahead log, there's a capture process that's gonna mine the event, make it available downstream for data scientists or for downstream consumption teams, and eventually you can apply this um, you know, uh, downstream. Right? So this is a pattern, uh, so this actually is one of the first things that I came across which talks about the prominence of change data streams from a database within a data mesh. This is a key piece if you guys are thinking about the data mesh, particularly because the systems that we've invested in, which are our operational systems, tend to have transactions, and transactional data as event streams doesn't always behave very nicely, as I'm going to tell you. Right? What you need, let me just skip this slide and just get to the complexity part of it in the interest of time. So if you take a look at a straightforward um, uh, DML, which is an insert, update, delete type of an operation, um, generally in a database, 
um, you know, it, it, it has some peculiarities. Um, you know, when you insert a record in a, in a table, if you query for that record, usually what you write is what you read, right? I mean, I, I have a key along with a bunch of attributes, I read it. If, if I'm logging that and I do an update, I don't get the entire record in the, in the log. Right? Typically, I would get the key, I might get the, in fact, it's actually depending on the logging system, it could be at a byte offset, at a physical offset. Um, just saying that, hey, in this block, I changed at byte offset 256, these 16 bytes, here's the newer values of those attributes that were present there. So how do you then take that change stream and make it available for logical purposes to apply that to a Google BigQuery system or a Snowflake system? That's your problem at hand, right? So, so records are not always, uh, you know, simple structured types. That's point number one. Um, some keys may not be logged, so that's a problem. I mean, let's take a simple example again of the update. So, if I update a record, a customer record, and I want to take that in my other example, if I want to take that uh, into a replica, if I try to update that. Um, and I have no key, it's going to scan <laughs> that uh, system. So again, um, 100 records, high school problem, right? 10,000 records, maybe early college problem. But now if you're talking about you know, terabytes of data and billions of rows and so forth, now you gotta like, be clever about how your access methods work, how your indexing works. So that's really the problem with the key. So you, you wanna make sure that your keys actually do get logged in the right way in the log so that you can pick those up and actually go replay them, okay? So in a nutshell, um, you know, what I wanted to express was from the log, it is possible to actually get the data as well as the metadata so long as you follow the, the, the appropriate log mining APIs um, and you, are, you're, you're, um, you know how to handle it as you take the event along to the data product, right? And so an example of this on the right side is a structure. So this is a logical change record structure that at least some of us have tried to unify so that from Postgres, MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, HP, nonstop, whatever your databases might be, you can represent them in a canonical fashion. So now you can only take a look at a singular record and make sense of it because it's easier to consume downstream now. Okay, as opposed to you transforming each specific database's LCR into you know, your own format. Okay, here's what that looks like physically. There's an insert, update, delete. For those of you who are interested, I can share the slide. The, uh, it's maybe hard to read from the back. The point of the slide was in the center, there's an update statement. If you just go down below, there's a you know, before and after. And so that's what I mean by logging the before and the after images. And so it's important if you are trying to do a workload, let's say in your analytics system like Snowflake, and you want to go and keep a record of all, the, all of the events, right? An update better re reflect all of the records somehow. So if you're doing it with event streaming, you may only get the af before after images, but not the columns that weren't changed. So you have to be able to construct them somehow. Okay, and that leads to concepts downstream post application where you may do things like, hey, there's a staging environment where I push this and then there's a merge operation, there's a base table concept and I can merge these two things together, okay? Hopefully that's, make, that's making sense. So continuing along uh, the approaches to handle change streams, um, the other interesting problem here that you might have come across is um, if you have very, very large transactions, let's say 30, 40, 50 million records, um, oftentimes you may have need a place to buffer it. Simple example, as I'm ordering something, I may add items to my basket. Okay, there are two types of consumers here. A consumer who is interested in that event only if I purchase. There's another uh, consumer who is interested in the fact that, oh, Alok actually went in and expressed this choice but backed out of that transaction. Two consumers for different purposes. So I have five minutes uh, according to the sign, so I'm gonna go a little bit faster. <laughs> Um, so the, the key point that I want to uh, make here is there are about 10 complexities that I've listed here. There are ways to deal with this thing. But if you're embarking on a mesh pattern and you're trying to make it real time, I think you should be aware that these complexities exist and there are ways how you want to address these. Um, so from streaming uh, architecture to implementation, uh, these are the design time and runtime challenges. Uh, I don't have time to go into each one of them, but I'm going to actually take maybe a minute to highlight some of them. A peculiar, particularly thorny problems is the idea of keeping things continuous. So imagine that you, know, you have data sources that are siloed, there's a data product. 
Okay, multiple things can happen here. One of the silos may not be available. The data product may not be available. If you're moving the event streams, there's a backbone that supplies the event stream data movement uh, techn technical choice. That may not be available. So when these things go up and down, you need to do state maintenance, and state maintenance is a key piece of this, of this puzzle. Right, so and that's where I find a lot of developer teams in just across the world trying to repeatedly struggle with that same problem of where are my checkpoints in the in the log or in the database where I'm consuming the data from, where are they when I'm applying it? Another perspective on that is the exactly once processing, at least once processing, um, you know, uh, or you know, uh, zero uh, zero or more delivery. So, so those processing guarantees tie in into, into, into uh, this failure handling. So I want to encompass all these streaming patterns and just tell you how we have approached it. Um, and so I'm from Stream. I think I mentioned that earlier. I tried to make the talk a little bit not without a vendor pitch because I really wanted to share some of the real-time perspective. So very quickly, what we've done is if you take a look at a number of these data sources, in pattern one, there is a way in Stream that we have you know, in a, in a uniform manner, you know, implemented a change data capture layer, which is our continuous change data cap capture layer. And in streaming pattern one, you can really help, it helps you build these data products, right? And these data products are on the right side. So you could think that there are your operational databases or your Kafka-based uh, queues, uh, data coming in over just the web or over IoT, and you're able to take these in to the, to the, and build these data products. Most of the time what we see our teams trying to just take data from maybe Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, and so forth, and they're trying to, on the right side, build a data product that might be on Snowflake or Databricks or uh, Azure, uh, Google, et cetera. Right? And along the way, you want to do minimal transformations because oftentimes you want to carry the metadata along. Going back to my first par, uh, 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 few slides around the fact that you still want to make sure the data is private. Well, how do you keep it private? One of the ways to keep it private, if I'm sharing data with you, for you to cons consume, and you are a lab technician who shouldn't be otherwise having access to my, the fact that possibly I'm an alcoholic, right, in the doctor's notes, you need to strip that out. That's the transformation function in between. So that's where you can apply some of these rules and you can enrich the data with additional um, user uh, metadata. Uh, you could also incorporate some machine learning models and so forth along the way. There are, there are uh, APIs available for that in stream. And that's how you build these data products in streaming pattern number two. Okay, so if I imagine, okay, to simplify things, imagine I get like some high value uh, transactions or some specific customers. I can say, oh, five customers from the same region, something is hot, alert somebody. That just became a data product service. That's what I'm talking about the, the, at the top. Um, and then uh, two technical points, uh, I can discuss this uh, with you guys uh, offline. There are two innovations we have done here. One is the abstraction of data streams so that it has an in-memory pattern, uh, uh, in-memory implementation and a persistent implementation. The in-memory one uh, is being done using uh, 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 0MQ, which is a high-speed messaging system. So literally you can scale up to millions of events per second. And the num second one is to decouple uh, the publisher and the consumer where the streaming backbone here is backed by Kafka, but at least the stream users are oblivious to it. You can actually just ask for a stream, and if you choose to persist it, then we define the topic at the back end for you. Thereby, you don't have to worry about managing the, 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 the streaming backbone layer itself. Okay, so with that, my last summary um, slide. So today, I wanted to talk about the data mesh patterns. Consumer flexibility is key here. Yeah, you have to be able to work uh, seamlessly between these data products. Uh, in modern data stacks, you have to address continuous low latency data in real time. There are three streaming patterns like I talked about, real-time data integration pattern, uh, there was the data as products uh, in the pipeline pattern, and number three was the reverse ETL actionable insight pattern. Um, and from a technology perspective, we can help you implement uh, your data mesh, so come talk to us if you're interested. We have a booth on 738, I think. And thank you so much for your time. I went fast, but I'm available for some questions uh, later on. Thank you.